Hello, my name is Mark Vernon and I am delighted to be joined by Robin Dunbar. Hi there, Robin. Hello. Robin is the Oxford Professor of Evolutionary Psychology and his latest book, one of many, is How Religion Evolved and Why It Endures. It's almost the culmination of a lot of work across related areas that I think has quite extensive implications for the scientific study of religion, particularly for those who are religiously minded. And so Robin, I was hoping to cover off the essence of what you're putting to us in the book and then ask some questions some ramifications that may or may not follow in your mind as well as for others. Sounds good to me. Very good, thank you. So look, if I can summarize it like this, your um, proposal is that our religious origins or maybe the particular religious departure that marks Homo sapiens compared to other Homo species like say Neanderthals begins right at the origins of the emergence of Homo sapiens, say around 200,000 years ago, is, the date is discussed, but say around then. Um, so it's integral to our appearance on planet Earth. Um, it comes about with a more sophisticated engagement with ritual and also particularly with trance. That's very prominent in your book, this kind of bonding effervescence, as it's also being called, that arises from an increased cognitive ability. The technical term is mentalizing compared, say, with Neanderthals. And so this launches Homo sapiens into a new chapter of experiencing relating to the world in the ways that we would now call religious. Is that a reasonable summary? Could you kind of expand on it a little further? That sounds like a very good summary to me. I think the issue is, um, is a combination of perhaps two things coming together, um, step by step, perhaps rather than all at once. Uh, one of them is, is an increasing ability to wonder about what lies behind the superficiality of the world we live in as we see it and experience it, which allows us to imagine whether there could be another world, if you like, that's parallel to ours, i.e. in this case, the spirit world, transcendent world, um, and indeed to do many other things, including uh, fiction, for example, because we couldn't tell stories if we couldn't imagine that there might be a different world, a different physical world to the one we live in, in which we can uh, construct fictional characters and fictional stories. Of course, allows us to do all sorts of interesting things like science, um, as well as religion. Um, so, so there's that sort of key element. Now, I, I I think the Neanderthals had some capacity, some considerable capacity really, uh, to engage in that kind of activities. It's just they couldn't do it in quite as deep a way as uh, anatomically modern humans managed to do that, say, our species. So it's a sort of phase transition across sort of rather um, uh, I'd say dimly uh, aware of these things in the case of Neanderthals, but that's possibly a bit of a harsh way of putting it, into a sort of much sharper focus of um, how we interpret these things. But these are sort of built on top of this kind of raw feels, emotional engagement with um, things we can't explain. And I think that has a lot to do with the origins of religion, that, that especially if you're going into things like deep caves, um, you know, you can become very disoriented and you, you know, see shadows on the wall and um, with this capacity to mentalize, you start to ask, well, you know, who's making the shadows? Is this yeah. an animal? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it is it's fascinating to speculate on Neanderthal religiosity compared with that of Homo sapiens. I mean, is this a fair summary that where, say, a Neanderthal might have thought or um, shared with others the sense that, say, this land belongs to us and our ancestors, that Homo sapiens might have added this land belongs to us and our ancestors and was given to us by some kind of spirit or God or presence. Yes, I think that would be a, a, a kind of reasonable kind of example, as it were. It, it's, um, I think it, it, in, in terms of 
the evolution of religion or religiosity, uh, it, it very much has to do with the ability to um, engage or, or, or produce and understand propositions which are really quite complicated, but um, allow you to exchange ideas about what and why um, things um, are and how things happen out, out there, as it were. Um, and in a, let's say, a spirit world, um, in a way which is not possible for uh, species that don't have as highly developed mentalizing capacities as we do. And that's to say all other animals, basically. Um, but, uh, you know, in a more com when we can do that in a more complex way than Neanderthals could, um, in the kind of way you, you, you suggested, then it leads us to have a difference between what I call um, social religions, is the kind of thing maybe that Neanderthals uh, had, which was, you know, I have these experiences and I can tell you about them and I can tell you what I believe, but um, you're not necessarily committed to that. Whereas I think with modern humans, the extra mentalizing capacities that we'd evolved allowed us to engage in discussions which committed both of us. Once you've explained uh, to me what's going on and uh, uh, what you believe to be going on, uh, and, and I'm convinced by that, we can, we can both agree on um, what it's all about. And that's what I call kind of communal religion. And I think that's the essence of um, religion proper in that sense, in that it, uh, you might have your private personal beliefs, but if you can't communicate them to me, uh, it's not a religion. <laughs> yeah. It, so, in the sense that a religion has to be a communal um, activity. And just to um, emphasize as well that this sense of sharing beliefs, your clear was shared originally much more through shared experience, shared rituals, shared yes. myths, say yes. shared sense of the presence of that yes. parallel world that's around. So animism would be the shorthand for that now. And then maybe was added afterlife, then and relations to ancestors, then these so-called religious specialists like shamans start to appear who can guide others through these parallel cosmologies. And then only quite recently, high gods um, and then yeah. doctrinal religion yeah. and, and what we think of as belief most immediately now appears after you know many, many millennia, the high gods yeah. and doctrinal stuff is really only in the last few thousand years. Yes, so, so I think the, the, the sort of sequence really is a case of a very, very long early period from when we first appear, maybe 200,000 years ago, 250,000 years ago, maybe, um, uh, right the way up through to the Neolithic, uh, where religions were much more, I call them immersive religions, because there's no priesthood, there's no theology, um, there's no kind of moral code handed down from above. Um, people have a moral code, but it's a social code that we all agree about. Um, but they, they, you know, they're, they're built very much around experiences and, and engaging in activities and ritual activities like trance dancing and so on that take you into the spirit world. So everybody's doing it. There isn't a sort of specialized priesthood who stand, if you like, between um, uh, the high altar and the nave, that everybody's up there gathered around the high altar, if you like. And that with the Neol Neolithic and, and the need to live in large settlements, you find the emergence of, certainly our, the archaeological evidence suggests this, the emergence of uh, doctrinal religions, meaning they have priesthoods and temples and uh, um, what we would call temples, religious spaces, specialized religious spaces, religious specialists, um, and also uh, some sense of gods up there who take some sort of interest in our human activities, but they tend not to be uh, the kinds of interests that we associate, let's say, with the contemporary world religions. They're, they're much more the kinds of gods that want you to do lots of sacrificing to them because they like being sacrificed to, but actually uh, their only interest in us humble humans down here is to punish us if we don't do <laughs> give them enough sacrifices. But I, the, you know, that, that, that phase 
uh, um, lasts for quite a long time, it seems, uh, but somewhere between, well, essentially it was the first millennium BC, so between uh, two and 3,000 uh, years ago, uh, suddenly you see all the modern world religions, up, sometimes referred to as the revealed religions, um, sort of appearing almost at a go. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. They, they just all pop up. And here you have the concept of moral high gods who, if you like, are benevolent gods as opposed to, to those who just demand things of, of their servants, so human servants. I mean, I, so I mean, you're, there's so much in, in what you're saying, and 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 there's kind of this discussion, even controversy on the scientific side, but also kind of on the religious side in all that. So you know, just to kind of tease out a little bit more of the the lie of the land there. I mean, just on this business of punishing high gods. Um, I mean, that has been quite a standard account of why religion is beneficial along with also gods that might promise you some sort of security in relation to death. Um, but one of the things which you, um, that chimes throughout your book actually is this idea that the benefits of religion can't be the causes of religion. And so religiosity must come first. Um, and, and for me, that, that's a very powerful notion because I wonder whether our ancestors until really quite recently, maybe even the last few hundred years, they experience life as sort of moving through rivers and seas of meaning and the, 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 all the rituals and the libations and the sacrifices and so on were as much about how to relate to that flood of meaning and sort of stay, um, you know, on top of it or, or find a way through it uh, rather than um, is there a meaning at all? My goodness, is there a God out to get me? Um, you know, perhaps um, these gods don't even exist um at all i mean that's a very modern kind of thought yes um, no, I, I i very much agree with that um that that is this sort of sense uh the theme of the book in many ways that um you know our, our ability to ask questions of the physical world of the world in which we live generally uh and indeed i suppose the social world um seems to me to have been the trigger for, for, for the evolution of religions. And, it, and it, it took a long time, if you like, because in effect, yes, you know, uh, uh, our early ancestors were having these experiences which they could not explain. They, they, they would go into trance states and, and, and they would have experiences while, while there, which they could remember afterwards, but didn't have a good explanation for them. And it, and it just took a long time in the natural course of things for people to figure out, if you like, what was going on. And I think probably an, an obvious and early step, and this has been suggested as one of the reasons why religions evolved, and it's sort of half right, I think, is that it, and it's kind of an obvious thing to say, well, if there are kind of, if there's a kind of uh, spirits in the spirit world, you know, they may have control over the way the world works, and particularly with these kind of animist beliefs, which seem to be very characteristic of these early phases, where you know things like springs that are associated with spirits, or maybe mountains are associated with spirits, or particular trees are associated with spirits, whom we can ask to try and um, uh, act on our behalf, as it were, and, and prevent the bad things happening, or help the good things to happen that we want to happen. So, you know, sort of doing things like curing diseases or foretelling the future or um, uh, uh, making us lucky in love, um, you know, so the production of charms and, uh, and so on and prayers of some kind for to, to, to enable these things to happen or to forestall the things we don't want to happen. It seems a very natural first step, you know, when you know that you can't control the vagaries of this um, rather terrifying world that we live in uh, at least you know sort of in, in in natural environments we live in you never know when you're going to bump into a predator on the plains or you know a, a, a mountain stream is going to turn into a torrent and sweep your village away um so those kind of things seem seem a natural step but i i kind of my sense is yes these things happen and are important in the process of people's lives and in the process of 
the evolution of religion, but really in the end, what it was all about was a very effective way of creating a bonded society, of keeping the group uh, on the same page, if you like, and also helping to dampen down the inevitable frictions that arise when you live in relatively large, um, <clears throat> spatially compressed settlements. Um, and these, these are problems which are you know, by no means unique to humans. It's problems which all our uh, uh, monkey and ape um, uh, cousins have to deal with all the time and find solutions to, but, but humans have faced these problems um, on a very grand scale because they live in, by primate standards, much bigger groups. I'm not talking about you know, mega cities <laughs> the size of uh, London <laughs> or Jericho even. <laughs> Uh, I'm just talking about hunter-gatherer-sized groups of, of maybe a few hundred people. Um, and something is necess seems to be necessary to, to keep the lid on the frictions that naturally arise in those sort of groups. And <coughs> religion seems to have played a particularly important role in that respect. And it does seem to work on, in small-scale societies. It really does seem to work. It, yeah, and your book, your book lands this with... Um, the tangible um, properties of endorphins, um, yes. which you know can be measured, and even in modern congregations, the the sense of coming together, um, worshiping, um, seeking forgiveness, which would be the sort of religious way of putting that. Um, in terms of the hormones, um, there's the release um, that comes about with those collective activities, kind of synchronized engagements together, um, and so even now you can measure even. Um, the benefits of religiosity and even compare with more secular forms of coming together you you suggest there's evidence that the religious shared communal activities are more effective actually at, at bringing people together and um yep. uh, and erasing the difficulties of the past yep. yeah I mean, this goes back to the to really the processes that are used or the mechanisms that are involved in creating social bonding, both at the individual friendship level, but also at the communal level. And these mechanisms seem to be common <clears throat> to all the primates, all the monkeys, snakes, and ourselves. And they involve the endorphin system in the brain. <clears throat> and the activities that we all do uh, in the course of our social engagements with, with friends and family and so on, um, really uh, are remarkable in the way they trigger this system. <coughs> um, the, the, the endorphins are chemically related to, to morphine, but um, just slightly different. So we don't actually get addicted to them in the way we do to things like morphine. But they give us the same effects of this kind of feeling of relaxation and a calmness and <clears throat> all's well with the world. And uh, they create a sense of trust with the people you engage in the particular activities uh, with that trigger the endorphin system. Um, and in that sense, they sort of create this sense of bondedness or belonging, um, <clears throat> both in terms of friendships and in terms of uh, the wider community that's actually engaged in these things. Now, the activities that are involved uh, in humans uh, involve things like laughter and singing and dancing and feasting together and telling emotional stories but it turns out well <clears throat> let's say you know immediately you can sort of see many of those are part of religious rituals particularly the singing to some extent the dancing in some religions uh, the storytelling <clears throat> even the feasting um, and indeed it turns out that when we looked at um, various kinds of religious uh, um, uh, <clears throat> services, um, what goes on in the service in terms of praying and kneeling and <clears throat> standing, all these activities and the singing and so on, do trigger the endorphin system and do create this sense of belonging. They very much create this sense of being part of a community. What's interesting is, is it really only works for the people who are there on the day. It doesn't affect your relationships as with people who don't turn up, which is another good reason for having <clears throat> in the kind of 
uh, doctrinal religions in general, which essentially provide you with a reason for keep turning up to the, the ritual services, um, for having that injunction which says, no, you've got to turn up every Sunday or Friday or whatever it is, because you need to keep having that um, uh, endorphin um, inoculation, if you like, in order to maintain this sense of belonging. If, if some people kind of get lazy, don't, don't turn up, then the community doesn't have that sense of um, <clears throat> social cohesion that, that seems to be important in the whole process. So yes, it's a very simple pharmacological mechanism, but it's actually quite widespread um, in terms of how it's used in the social environment. I, I was lucky enough to come along to um, at least a couple of the uh, gatherings that you held um, to explore some of these ideas most recently um, under the auspices of the International Society for Science and Religion. And one of the things that was striking about the people in the room is that they were engaging with these questions from sort of both sides of actual faith commitments. You know, there were yes. the theologians as well as um, biologists and others. Um, and I, you know, I wonder just to ask about the truth value as well as the practical value of these kind of engagements. I mean, to put it in a slightly more sophisticated way, I hope, um, I'm, I, as I've been reading around this subject, um, you know, largely prompted by your research with others, um, I've been reading figures like Robert Bella, um, Augustin Fuentes, um, and then also um, Simon Conway Morris, um, the, uh, Cambridge evolutionary biologist. And what's interesting to my mind um, about um, what they describe is, it's, it's touching on what you're saying here, which is that it couldn't have been just survival that led to the exploration of religion and the increasing evidence that what Robert Bella calls offline activities mattered quite as much as online. Um, Augustin Fuentes makes these very interesting remarks about how because things take so long to change for most of human history, it must have been something else that kind of kept people at it. And so the participation, the immersion, the sense of relating not just to each other, but to the world around must have been what drew people in um, and qualities like beauty, the aesthetics of it all and so on, which, you, which we see in the um, archeological record with the beauty of painting and the beauty of hand axes and um, all the, the material elements that remain. And Simon Conway Morris would even go so far, I think, if I can um, you know, stand, stand in for him, as to say that evolution itself is a kind of exploratory mechanism as well as a means for working out what works in terms of survival um, and so it's in the human manifestation as well as the physical side of our survival in terms of the cognitive the mental the imaginative side it is exploring a reality that's out there we're adapting to something that's real um, immaterially as well as materially you might say now it's not said that we get it right and that's quite clear too because religion is very very diverse but yet nonetheless there is some sense from these thinkers that there's something about truth that's going on here that's really what I wanted to drive at and I just wonder what you make of, of that side of things yeah I, I tended to take the the, the view um, that what you make of it uh, really is a matter of belief that it, it probably is beyond um, <clears throat> uh, conventional proof, if you like. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, one consequence of that is, uh, for better or for worse, is that, you know, two people with different views uh, can uh, come to different conclusions about, you know, the sort of... Uh, religious truth, if you like, a spiritual truth of, of, of what we see or, or, or experience. And that will partly depend on, you know, their background and whether they're uh, sci uh, scientists or, or not scientists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm kind of less interested in that, um, if you like, than in the role that religion has played in, in our lives. Now, I think it's perfectly fair of those um, various uh, comment uh, commentaries, as it were, to say that 
you know, things like beauty and, and, and the like have, have played an important role. Um, I, I tend to see those as consequential rather than causal, um, that in the end, what's driving most of these things, and certainly from an evolutionary point of view, is uh, finding mechanisms or evolving bits of the body or ways of doing things uh, that allow you to um, <clears throat> reproduce more successfully. That's what Darwin in evolution underpins Darwin in evolution. Um, my pitch is much more that one of the issues that's kind of clouded how we approach religion in this area has been a kind of assumption that the only things that matter is your personal survival and your personal ability um, therefore to reproduce um, uh, as a result of not falling ill or, or uh, you know, not being caught by a predator. And, and the answer is, yes, that's true. That's the kind of bedrock, but we have to remember that um, how we conceive the processes of evolution has undergone some sea changes in the last 50 years or so, in which we've understood that um, the social environment in which an, in, an individual organism lives can be is very much part of that mix and especially so for, for the very social species as all the primates in fact are um, that uh, the key to their evolutionary success as a group has been their ability if you like put it this way to cooperate with each other i would put it more in terms of their ability to live with each other <laughs> Um, and, and to create these uh, large bonded groups, which are their defense against the, the threats uh, from the environment, if you like. It's, it's those group living abilities that have allowed them to be so successful. Sometimes you have to trade off your personal selfish interests uh, against the in wider interests of the group in order to make the group function in that way. But ultimately, all the benefits accrue back to you. It's how well you do either on your own or as a member of the group. And as a member of the group, it seems you invariably do much, much better. So there's these enormous pressures in the process of primate evolution to kind of solve the problems of how you keep groups functioning rather than falling out with each other and breaking up and dispersing and then of course losing all the benefits you uh, have from, from living in the group. And, and uh, what you see religion there, as being a key part of that mix. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, what you want describing there is, and which comes across very much in the book as well, is how religion is a dynamic thing. Yes. I mean, another cross pressure um, is between the mystical or the charismatic element, which is kind of the source, and then the more settled religiosity. They're kind of, in the biblical way of putting it, it would be between the prophets and the priests. Yes. And that, I mean, that even feels like something which religious people will know today in terms of the tension, say, within Christianity. You know, charismatic Christianity is the fast-growing strain of Christianity now, and certainly in the West, it can feel like the more doctrinal, organised churches are the ones struggling. But the point is that there's a kind of motor um, in religiosity you described that makes for tensions when it comes to delivering the benefits, particularly to larger populations. Uh, absolutely. Uh, um, and, and I might just... Um, add one more uh, comment vis-a-vis -vis what we were talking about previously, and that actually is that the endorphin system, while providing you with this mechanism for bonding groups, turns out to have a secondary benefit, which perhaps explains some of the more individual health-related benefits that you see from uh, religious uh, religiosity and religious attendance. And that is the endorphins trigger the release of natural killer cells in, in the immune system, the white blood cell system, and really do have, it seems, uh, influence your personal health uh, as a result of, uh, of being activated. So the, it, you, there's a twofold benefit going on here. One is a benefit at the social level, creating a sense of belonging and bonding. Uh, and the other is, is a very direct effect at, on your physical and psychological well-being. Of course, Actually, endorphins are the best antidepressants you can ever get because uh, they a they come for free. You don't have to buy them. All you have to do is uh, uh, trigger their release in the brain. Um, 
and they're much more powerful as, as um, antidepressants and, and uh, painkillers than even morphine is. So, um, you know, they, 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 they really do have direct benefits and, if you like, indirect benefits. But I think it's the indirect benefits that are really the substantive ones. Um, but in terms of the uh, <clears throat> role of these, this uh, ancestral small scale, if you like, charismatic, um, immersive shamanic type religions. I, I, one of the key arguments in the book has been that these have never gone away. And there's been, I think, a tendency, at least in the theoretical literature, maybe not in the experience of everyday uh, members of, of, of uh, a particular church or religion, uh, but certainly at the sort of uh, scientific approaches, the academic approaches to understanding religion uh, and perhaps the theological approaches is to assume that, you know, the, the doctrinal religions in general, but the um, uh, revealed or axial age religions as they're sometimes called in particular, the world religions as we have them now, is sort of somehow just replaced all these early forms of, of uh, trance-based religions and done away with them. Um, uh, 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 and, and I suppose that's kind of implicit in the sense that they're often called the revealed religions, that you know, this is the true way of doing it. Do away with all these old uh, superstitious things. And indeed, very often that is how the hierarchies uh, behave. They, they really don't like these kind of mystical, charismatic types of um, uh, um, activities that, that often go on in, in the interstices, interstices of the, their various religions. My, my, my argument is very much that actually it's just the doctrinal religions are just bolted on top of this basic, very widespread, fundamental um, kind of mystical component. And that mystical component is the real motor of religiosity and religion. That's why you join a religion. It's not because somebody gives you a long lecture, a dry lecture on theology. It's because you have these kind of feelings of warmth and excitement and, uh, and are drawn into it uh, in a very much a raw feel sort of way. Your clear feel for religion and the feeling of religion is I think one of the reasons why the book's going to appeal to a lot of religious believers and indeed you know it's called how religion evolved and why it endures you conclude by suggesting um, that religion will always be with us um, which is a bit of a counter narrative um, compared to a lot of the secular studies of religion in more recent decades I mean would you even go so far as to say that if religions differ the fact of religiosity as a distinctive feature of Homo sapiens could be a shared story, even a shared sacred story. It's the, the differences are there, but the fact that um, it's there at all is um, part of what we might come to understand um, as, as a value nowadays, um, as much as the particularities. Uh, yes, I think I, I, I'd probably go along with that. I mean, I think it is clearly, if you like, an inevitable part of human nature. It is part and parcel of what it is to be human, in fact. Um, and, and it is a consequence of, you know, our ability to reflect on and be stimulated by um, <clears throat> the, both these kinds of ideas and the kinds of experiences you have in the rituals of religion. The rituals used in religion are very much geared by and have been presumably selected for uh, over time in, a, in a, a learning sense. You know, people realize that some things work better than others and therefore go for them. But they've been selected for the very fact that they trigger this kind of more emotional component, uh, the singing, the, you know, sort of, uh, uh, tragic and meaningful stories that are often tied up in, in, in religious texts uh, and sermons, of course. All these things sort of produce these feelings of uh, these endorphin based uh, feelings of, of uh, deep meaningfulness and 
um, uh, warmth in us that, that and, and are very rewarding as well. Endorphins are extremely rewarding, um, uh, as are in the short term, all opiates are. Um, so you want to come back for more, you know, this is sort of, um, and I think this is the key to the issue is, you know, that in, in the end, uh, you can have doctrinal religions with their top-down discipline being imposed by the hierarchy, uh, um, the theologically uh, sort of correct hierarchy on all these theologically incorrect, the sort of little bubbles that are bursting up from underneath and sort of form of charismatic uh, cults and sects. Um, but, you know, that's the perennial problem is, is that if you try and enforce things by, by discipline alone, people will grudgingly do it, but if they can get away with it, they won't. Uh, if, if you want something to work in any form of social uh, or political uh, system, it's much better to have it coming from the individual. You know, it's your commitment. You're much more likely to stick by the rules, if you like, and behave better if, you, if it's coming from within you than being imposed on, on top, you see see that every day um you know driving down the motorway <laughs> i can almost i can almost hear you suggesting a strap line to try to sell religion come for the best quality endorphins at a church near you um i don't suppose that's going to be taken over and of course just to to nod as well that in that bubbling up is the dark side of religious expression as well the things can get out of control as we are all too aware of as well. And you do yeah. talk about that in the book. But yes, I, 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 but I think it's important, is not, you know, we shouldn't entirely blame, blame the bubbling up. In other words, one of the arguments in the book is that this explains why, two things actually, which are quite interesting, why parish sizes tend to be of a characteristic size uh, and have great difficulty increasing their size beyond that, as, as many of the church planting discussions in, in, in uh, uh, Protestantism at least have, have um, recognized over the last some decades. But also explains why you have this constant bubbling up in all the world religions of new sects. And of course, some of those sects, I mean, very often those sects do have slightly questionable theologies <laughs> and practices. Um, uh, and there are many examples of, uh, uh, of that in the history of Christianity, as well as other religions, but also at the same time, uh, out of those bubblings up come eventually some of the, or eventually all the world religions, all the world religions as we have them now, Buddhism, Christianity, uh, Islam, etc., etc., all had their origins as these little charismatic -y type cults built around you know, very often uh, uh, a particular, particularly charismatic individual. Um, it, it's not entirely obvious why some of these succeed and others don't. Uh, it's never been satisfactorily um, resolved, I think, but it is clearly the case that, you know, a handful of these little charismatic cults blossom uh, and, and uh, expand rapidly and enormously and, and become, if you like, very popular and successful. Um, but it doesn't, you know, diminish the fact that even once they've become successful, they face the same problem, bubbling up from underneath a yet more uh, uh, mystical and charismatic uh, cults. And so the thing is the perpetuating cycle, which is why the, the hierarchies then, you know, try to impose on them and, and suppress all these charismatic cults from underneath. But nonetheless, I think what it pitches to is the sense that it's these small kind of um, intimate groups uh, in which, you know, there are these kind of emotional, mystical experiences that take place uh, during services in particular, that are the motor really of, of all religion. Now, some of those clearly you know, can get out of hand, but I think we shouldn't forget that probably more trouble is created by the, at the other end of the scale, by the use of religious coherence to promote political interests. You know, the political, the, the religious wars of past centuries and dare I say it, future centuries, you know, have all been driven not by the charismatic cults so much as, you know, the established religions trying to fight against each other.
Um, but w and you know sometimes you sort of wonder why uh, they sh they should um, uh, uh, so take take ill against each other. <laughs> if you sit down and look at it, you, you know one obvious answer is very much the economical uh, kind of view that well you know um, they're all pitching essentially at the same thing. They may have slightly different rituals and they may have slightly different ways of expressing it. Uh, in the different world religions, but actually most of them are treading pretty much the same path in the same direction, and, and it should be possible to produce a unified religion by them all sitting down to agree. That all sounds very nice in theory. I think where it falls down is back down to the charismatic cults at the bottom bubbling up. <laughs> as soon as you've, you've, you've created a, a, a grand unified religion, you'll just still have the little cults, because it's you know, there's something emotionally engaging about the what happens in these small cults that's very difficult to replicate on a very, very large scale. That takes me back to where we began, really, with how our early ancestors were engaging with worlds that exceeded them, um, the yeah. truth that was beyond them, even as they felt its impact in their lives. Um, and it's to say that your book, you know, is very suggestive in all sorts of directions when it comes to lived religious lives. And so I can wholeheartedly recommend it to people. It's a, it's a, it's a good read as well, um, another way of commending it. So thanks very much indeed, Robin, for taking the time to unpack some of the implications and the science indeed. Well, it's a great pleasure. Thank you for your very complimentary <laughs> observations on the book. I have to say it was... Of all the books I've written, one of the most interesting to actually and fun in a way to actually write.